You are listening to the Pop Culture Academy. And if you want to get more thoughtful insight on all things pop culture, don't forget to follow us on Twitter and YouTube and check out our webpage at popcultureacademy.com. Greetings and salutations, and welcome to Season 2, Episode 15 of the Pop Culture Academy, where we do all things pop culture with just just a bit of an academic slant. I'm your host, M.K. Adkins, and uh, well, let's talk a little bit about what's happened since the last time we spoke. I, I've been watching a new series on Netflix. I, actually, I say a new series. It's a new series to me. I think it was uh, 2013 to 2016, so, so not, not a fresh new series, but... Um, But these days, you know, there's so many things that we miss and you got to constantly be going back and adding things that that somehow you didn't catch the first time. This one's called Hinterland. Right up my alley. It's a a British mystery series. I mean, I suppose you'd say British. It's a British mystery series, which is my absolute favorite genre, sort of my comfort food, if you will, Um, set in Wales and dark, dreary not you know, atmosphere is dark and dreary uh the 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 crimes are extremely dark and dreary the central character the, the, i've actually been pleased as they've gone into the second season that they've now made the that they're actually now kind of i would say two central characters um the central character is this uh troubled a detective from Britain who has, um, in the beginning, we don't know why, but has moved out to Wales to to begin working uh, for the Wales Police Department. He's partnered with uh, a, a woman who's who's local to Wales, and so in some ways, it's very broad church like, if you will. Uh, and and I suppose those series were out at the same time, which may mean that could explain why this one didn't get quite the love that 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 one did. Uh, you know, my wife says that that I've never met a troubled a troubled character that I didn't like. I, you know, I like those characters who really have, you know, emotional baggage. But 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 my argument is that every great character in literature, film, television, all, all the great characters have emotional baggage. That that's what makes an interesting character, right? I mean, who would who would Captain Ahab be if he hadn't lost his leg to a white whale? You know, what, what would be the point at that, at that point? So anyway, um, Hinterland, I would definitely recommend it if you like that sort of thing, mysteries, dark, a little bit darker. All right. So for this episode, I want to talk a little bit about one of my favorite artistic forms, and, and that is the concept album. Kind of a, in some ways, a vanishing art form, I would say, because uh, it's so rare for people to buy whole albums these days, right? People grab a song here, grab a song there, put it together in a playlist. That's the way it works. Um, but a, a, a very refined art form, I think. Difficult to do well, and uh, and very serious when it's when it's done when it's done well when it's done properly. I, I want to think today about Taylor Swift's new album, Folklore which I'm going to argue definitely qualifies as a concept album and is quite good as well, I should add. Um, but before we get into that specific album, let's talk a little bit more broadly about about what a concept album is. You know, is it one of those things that you just say, well, you know, I, I, I'll know it when I see it. Um, you know, for some, for instance, some people have argued that Frank Sinatra's album in the wee small hours of the morning, one of his classics from 1955, um, that 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 album is a concept album, uh, despite the fact that there's no, I mean, there's no theme running through it. There's no character that keeps reappearing, but it does have a certain feeling, a certain atmosphere. Um, but that's a question, right? Uh, it can can Miles Davis kind of blue can could could that be seen as a concept album? It's 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 an album that has definitely has a certain feeling, a certain mood. Um, it's 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 also united that album by a particular approach to jazz music. On the other hand, some some concept albums are are 
quite clearly that. I mean, you can't think of them as anything else. I mean, everyone would agree that pretty much all of Pink Floyd's albums are, are should be classified as concept albums, except you know, it, maybe those early ones where Sid Barrett was, was kind of running things. But after that, I mean, everything for them becomes a concept album. Uh, Genesis tends to put out, it's, it's a very prog rock thing, though it's not exclusively limited to prog rock. Simplest terms, a concept album is what the word says. It's an album whose songs are united by a concept. All right, but then that begs the question, what, what, does, con- what does concept mean here in this, in this case? You know, I, I like to talk about motifs, which is, an, that's an idea that's borrowed from music. The, the motif is an idea or an image or, or even a word that shows up again and again in a work and sort of holds, holds the work together, can kind of create sometimes its own underlying theme. And, and I would say concept albums tend to be united by some kind of common motif. I mean, I don't know that that necessarily, I mean, you know, we went from defining concept album to defining concept to defining mo- motif. Um, let's look at some examples. I mean, the Who's Tommy, right? That 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 is clearly a concept album, though though they, I mean, I guess a lot of people call that a rock opera, is, is a rock opera beyond a concept album. Um, but that album un- is united, very unified, has a single character, tells a single story, um, as I said, Genesis has used the concept album approach. And again, sometimes a character, a story, the, uh, the Lamb Lies Down on Broadway certainly has that feature. Could look at something like, um, I don't know, Sticks, Mr. Roboto. Uh, I, that album doesn't get much love anymore. It, I have fond feelings for it because it, it, it was popular in my youth. But it works. It's whether you like it or not. Certainly works as a good example here of an album with a with a central character and a plot line. Tori Amos likes to channel certain figures, often historical figures, like Under the Pink, for instance. Anastasia Romanoff is this this character, this not a character, a figure that she kind of uh, thinks about throughout the album. I mean. You know, there's an example where that's not the only thing in the album. There are other things there too, but that kind of gives the album that 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 historical figure gives that album its character. Pink Floyd, Dark Side of the Moon, maybe maybe the greatest concept album ever made. Maybe the make a case greatest album ever made, perhaps. I mean, a lot of people prefer The Wall, but but Dark Side of the Moon is is really there are no flaws in that album. And, uh, you know, what is, what is that about? What unites that album? You know, I used to teach that album. My students would say, okay, well, you know, what are we going to say this album's about? What's its concept? And the problem with, to some extent, that album is about life, right? Life and death and birth and madness and money. And there's not much that they don't get into, but you can't say, I mean, that's too broad, right? You can't say, oh, this concept album is about life. I, madness is a clear motif in, in a lot of Rogers Waters writing. Um, and here we get into the issue of how many concept albums can you make on the same concept or the same motif? Um, and does it become something beyond just a concept on a concept, a concept career, if you will, Alan Parsons, who underappreciated, I've, I've talked about recently his connection to Pink Floyd and, and dark side of the moon, uh, very key, concept album guy, particularly in the 70s, the early 80s. And, and my favorite of his, I mean, he he's, you know, people who are really into Alan Parsons love uh, The Raven, which is all about sort of Edgar Allan Poe, obviously. My favorite album of his is another underappreciated. Uh, it's called On Air, came out in the mid to late 90s, I want to say. And uh, the motif there is flight, right? And so there, there are songs about what, you know the first the first air flights uh, you know the Wright brothers there are songs about um, being afraid of flying there are songs on that album about space flight the, it, it's all kind of different angles on the idea of flight which and, and there is just a good album and then there you know there are lots of these um, from soft cells nonstop erotic cab- cabaret 
uh, Gary Newman's The Pleasure Principle, Sting's The Soul Cages, which deals with the death of his father, or, or Lou Reed's Magic and Loss, which deals with loss of a couple of his friends. Um, there, there are country versions, Willie Nelson's Red-Headed Stranger, or Teatro, uh, System of a Down, Green Day, Janet Jackson's Rhythm Nation, or all these. So, so it, it, it does get, these are, this is a reasonably popular form. It, but but not everybody can not everybody can do it, and you know it's not to say that this is the. I mean, there are plenty of albums. There are plenty of great albums that are organized around the the song, right? And and just just, just the little you know, Fountains of Wayne made great albums where they just made these wonderful song after song after song and they're not united by anything except that they're just brilliant studies in the song form all right but but back back to concept concept albums you know other other i mean again it's still hard to define right uh benfold five uh reinhold meissner uh cd album is that a concept album i mean i've had people argue to me that it, it certainly is and they can they can tell me the whole story that it's about a character uh and they take me through the whole story um i, I don't know springsteen's best album in my mind is uh nebraska which i think is is definitely a concept album um it has this 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 running theme about the the depression of poverty that that haunts america um that album came out in the early 80s um, Reagan's America and just this, I don't know, this this overarching sadness to that. It's, 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 it's one story after another on that album of people who have been crushed economically in one way or another and, and, and what they do as a result of being crushed. But, but, but then does Born in the USA, does that album qualify as a concept album? Is that united by something? Um, can the concept be just a mood or can can it be an approach? You know, Jerry Mulligan, the famous jazz saxophonist, uh, at one point has his groups, this is experimental, has his groups abandoned using the, using the piano. Uh, the piano was, is generally used to give the root chords to an ensemble and he didn't want a root chord, right? He wanted the instruments to simply be playing off of each other. Does that make that first album where he's experimenting with that, does that unite that album as a concept album? For that matter, are, are Sting's first two albums, right? Uh, Nothing Like the Sun, and uh, that's the second one, and Dream of the Blue Turtles. He, he completely ditches the idea of rock musicians and, and, and hires a bunch of jazz musicians and puts together these two albums. Does that unify? Does it, are those concept albums? Is, is certainly Paul Simon's Graceland, which was recorded completely in South Africa and which was making a statement about apartheid in South Africa and musicians. The songs, again, the songs aren't necessarily related to one another, but the concept is in the album itself. The concept is in what we're going to attempt to do here. But then if you stretch it too far, maybe every album is a concept album, right? I mean, any album... Most albums are united by the artist who produces that album, which which means, in some ways, they're all the product of one mind, and 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 so they hang together in that way. I, I don't know. In literature, there are some comparisons. I mean, a, a book of poetry is often united by a theme or a concept or an approach. You see that in photography books as well. Uh, in poetry, William Blake's "Songs of Innocence," "Songs of Experience." which incidentally have recently become the inspiration for U2's most recent albums. Wordsworth and Coleridge's Lyrical Ballads, which is, you know, trying to take, take a brand new approach to poetry, and that's in, you know, uh, 1798. But I think I like to compare concept albums to the form, uh, the literary form called the short story cycle. And what this is is a, is a collection of short stories that can all stand alone. That is, you could read them by themselves as short stories. They stand up as whole, complete stories. But they also seem to relate to one another in some important way. Really, the first important one of these was Sherwood Anderson's Winesburg, Ohio, from the early part of the 20th century. Again, every story 
its own story, its own characters, its own events. It has a climax. It comes to an end, and, and it works as its own little story. But they're all set in the same town, this, this fictional town of Winesburg, Ohio. And so you get to sort of see the whole town as you move from story to story to story. Early 20th century, again, Hemingway writes in our time where, again, every story is, is unique and different, but they're all about they're all about experience, his experience and his shell shock, post-traumatic stress after World War I. Similarly, you can, you can go into Tim O'Brien's The Things They Carried, which is a short story cycle that's all about uh, post-Vietnam. All right, all right so, so Taylor Swift's Folklore, which, which just came out, does it qualify as a concept album? And I'd, I'd say absolutely. We get certain motifs, again, words, images, ideas, that keep coming up over and over. Blood, for example, shows up over and over. Um, high heels show up frequently. A film shows up all throughout this album. Now, I, let me stop at this point and confess, I, I am not a Taylor Swift expert, right? And, and I, I honestly, I don't typically, th this isn't a show where we do reviews of contemporary albums, contemporary shows. I, I if something catches my eye, it's worth talking about as an example. You know, here we're talking about an example of a concept album. Uh, a few weeks back, we talked about Bob Dylan's new album as an example of, of what makes Bob Dylan so important to American literature. But generally, I like to do things that are uh, a little further in the past because it gives us a chance to reflect on them rather than just sort of spouting out, is this good? Is this bad? Should you listen to this? Should you not listen to this? But again, I was really captivated by this album, and particularly as a concept album. Um, but I'm not a Taylor Swift expert, and, and, and I've been a little amused as I've done a little, just the bare minimum of research into this album, at just how much of an industry it is deciphering her lyrics. I mean, I've, I've always known that people like to say this song or another song of hers is about, you know, this song's about this breakup and this song's about that breakup and this guy and that guy. I mean, but geez, the, the way pick, people pick her work apart. I mean, my, my life is about analyzing things and picking things apart. But, but surely there's a point where it gets to be just, just a little much. I mean, let it go, folks. But actually, I think that that gives me a unique take on her album. That is, I'm not really all that interested in Swiss biography. I, I, I just, I'm just not, right? I don't, I, I, that's just not my thing. And, and maybe this is a question for a, a whole other episode. But, but my question is this, what can we take from this album with now, without really knowing anything about Swift herself? Right? Does this album stand on its own? What, it's not what this album tells us about Swift, but rather, what does this album tell us? Period. Question mark. What is it really about? I mean, the thing that really strikes me the most about this album is this, there's a certain antiqueness to it. Cardigan sweaters, the, the mention of the Roaring Twenties, uh, there's this tale of the wealthy socialite, there are all these mentions of the cinema, images such as high heels on cobblestones, ghosts, hauntings, you know, even something that's relatively recent, like a t-shirt, it's vintage tees. Even, even there's a great song, uh, Mirror Ball, that connects us to the antique idea. And I mean, it connects for, for Taylor Swift, I mean, not for me. But for Taylor Swift, the mirror ball is, is sort of an, the 70s disco is, an, is definitely an antique kind of thing. But actually, the mirror ball dates back to the 1920s and the dance halls in the 1920s. It, it was sort of rediscovered at Studio 54. They, they kind of found it stuck in some back corner and thought, well, you know, let's put this up. And, and it becomes a staple of the disco era, but it, but it goes back much further. And so that's an antique as well. I mean, the word, the title is folklore, and, and that's, a, that's a fascinating choice. I mean, she uses that in so many different senses. You know, folklore is about revisiting history, but it's in a very particular way, right? It's mythical. That is, you expect folklore to be a little exaggerated, a little not true, but it's also personal. M myth 
tends to be about heroes and giants and uh, folklore is more, um, I don't know, more personal, more down to earth. Folklore, that's the stories that we invent as families or as a region. I mean, I'm, I'm from the South and folklore is a big part of the South, the Southern tradition. This is how we tell our tales. There's folklore about our family, our region, but, but I think there's also folklore that we tell ourselves about ourselves. A certain folklore that we invent about us that helps us explain who we are and our identity. You know, we all have kind of a certain folklore about, you know, our childhood. You know, what happened in your childhood is, is, is it's a little exaggerated in our memories. It's not quite real, but it is real. And, you know, and we, in our minds, we shape it so that it makes a certain kind of sense for us. I think all of that's going on in the use of this term. And, and there's a definite fusion here of past and present. That is, it, it, there is an antiqueness, and it is about folklore in, in the sense of thinking about the past, but it's also about folklore and thinking about the present. Over and over in this album, another of the motifs is that when you get something antique, often it is fused with something from the present, something contemporary. I mean, maybe the most important song on the album, I think, is, is The Last Great American Dynasty. Which, which brings together this woman from the 20s who, who is seen as too wild for her times um, with the speaker, who's presumably Swift. And the speaker sort of wraps herself in this mantle of, you know, I'm going to accept the gossip and controversy as a kind of badge of honor. You know, the woman from the 20s was, you know, people said terrible things about her. Uh, for her time. But the reason they said those terrible things about her was because she was living her life out loud. And I want to do that too. Now, again, there's this whole biographical thing. You know, Taylor Swift apparently bought this house. It does connect us to this actual woman. But leaving that aside, it's an interesting idea of the past and the present. And I'm going to try to, you know, finding finding feminist heroes in the past. And I'm going to try to live up to those heroes. And that mix of past and present runs through the whole album. But of course, you know, that's all of that is a useful turn on what Swift's already done, I think, for contemporary music. Her 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 enormous contribution to contemporary music is is her exploration of the situation of women in the 21st century, uh, especially in response to the Me Too movement. I mean, her music is so caught up in the Me Too movement, I think. I mean, she's thought of by a lot of people, her fans, but but also people who don't like her, as as someone who encodes all of her relationships into her music, like like it's some sort of self indulgent biography, or or, or worse, like self pity or revenge or, or whatever. But it's actually much deeper than that. She she turns all these varieties of romantic experience into some deeper commentary, um, not on relationships, although maybe there's a lot of commentary on relationships, but more on how women experience those relationships, the the struggles they face to define themselves in, in, in a changing world. You know, it's like she takes this single idea, this single thing, relationships, and she turns it and she turns it and she turns it and she turns it so that we can see it from one perspective and another perspective and another perspective and another perspective. And, I, you know, we won't get into how many artists have done that, but, but some of the great artists, that's the way they work. Henry James, for instance, comes to mind. This, this, I'm just going to take this one thing and I'm going to look at it from every possible way that I can see it. And so here, Taylor Swift does that again. But in this case, she sort of moves out to this broad historical perspective so that we can see how women over time it's got it's got contemporary relationships it's got past relationships and how do you all these relationships again we're turning and looking at them and, and thinking particularly about how women deal with these relationships how women find their identity in the contemporary world all right but that's enough for this week thanks so much for tuning in if you like what you hear please let us know follow us on twitter follow us on facebook check out our YouTube channel. You can always find us at popcultureacademy.com. And look, if you like us at all, tell your friends. Please tell your friends. I'll be back next week with an all new episode. 
see you then. <laughs>